In this video, we're going to pull together what we just learned about carbocations with the SN1 mechanism. It's important to consider the stability of carbocations, what that means in terms of how much energy it takes to form them, and then what effect that has on the rate of SN1 reactions. So as we saw in the last video, in terms of stability of carbocations, tertiary carbocations are more stable than secondary carbocations, which are more stable than primary, which are more stable than methyl carbocations. Now what we have here is basically four different energy diagrams, and we're looking at a protonated alcohol losing water to become a carbocation. And this information about the relative stability is reflected here. So this energy diagram is for a tertiary alcohol, a protonated tertiary alcohol, the bond breaking as water leaves, and then the tertiary carbocation is formed. Here we're starting with a protonated secondary alcohol forming a secondary carbocation. And so our tertiary carbocation is lower in energy. Our secondary carbocation is higher in energy. It is less stable. Here we have a protonated primary alcohol leading to a primary carbocation higher in energy than the others. And then finally here we have protonated methanol leading to a methyl carbocation much higher in energy than the others. Now we also have to take into consideration Hammond's postulate, which tells us that because this transition state is closer in energy to this product than this starting material, we know that the structure of the transition state must be similar to the structure of the carbocation. So Hammond's postulate then gives us the relative energy of the transition states. Because the tertiary carbocation is the most stable, the transition state leading to it will be lower energy than the transition state leading to a secondary carbocation. The transition state leading to a primary carbocation will be higher in energy than the others, and the transition state leading to a methyl carbocation is going to be the highest in energy. Now, does this make physical sense? Why do we have this relative energy of the carbocations? It's because the tertiary carbocations are the most stabilized by inductive effect and hyperconjugation. Those are less effective, less effective, less effective. Well, the transition state leading to those carbocations, we're gonna have significant positive character. And so the transition states can also be stabilized by inductive effect and hyperconjugation. So this transition state with this tertiary almost carbocation is going to be effectively stabilized by the delocalization of the charge by inductive effect and hyperconjugation. The transition state leading to the secondary carbocation will be stabilized but not as well. Less stabilization and the least stabilization and so the same factors that affect the stability of the carbocation will also affect the stability of the transition states. So we have information on the relative energies of the carbocation intermediates. We have information on the relative energies of the transition states. Those energies of the transition states determine the activation energy and then the activation energy is what determines the rate of the reaction. So understanding carbocation stability gives us information on reaction rate of any reaction that goes through a carbocation. So we know that a tertiary carbocation is more stable than a secondary, is more stable than a primary, is more stable than a methyl. How does this relate to an SN1 reaction? Remember, for an SN1 reaction, it is carbocation formation that is the rate determining step. So rather than carbocation stability, I'm going to write this as carbocation energy of a tertiary carbocation is lower than secondary, lower than primary, lower than methyl. 
Now, the transition state leading to that carbocation, its energy of a tertiary is lower than secondary, is lower than primary, is lower than methyl. So the resulting activation energy leading to tertiary is lower than secondary, lower than primary, lower than methyl. And so the rate of a tertiary will be faster than secondary, faster than primary, faster than methyl. So it is the carbocation stability that essentially determines the rate of the reaction. Now, whether we're talking about a methyl primary, secondary, tertiary, this first step is going to be similar, but this step is where the biggest variation comes in. So here we have a tertiary carbocation, and then this is the transition state leading to it, and so this is the resulting activation energy for a tertiary carbocation. Let's say this is the energy of a secondary carbocation, well then, here's what this is going to look like. And so the activation energy leading to a secondary carbocation will be higher, so the reaction will be slower. Here is the energy of a primary carbocation, and so this is what the reaction path will look like to get there. And then finally, if this is the energy of a methyl carbocation, then this is what that reaction path will look like to get there. And so we have the activation energy leading to tertiary, which gives us a fast rate of reaction, a relatively fast rate of reaction. The activation energy leading to a secondary is going to lead to a slower rate of reaction. The activation energy leading to a primary carbocation is higher, leading to an even slower reaction. And finally, the activation energy leading to the methyl carbocation is really, really big, leading to a really, really slow rate of reaction. So by understanding the mechanism of an SN1 reaction, it allows us to predict the reaction that is going to happen. Here we have a tertiary alcohol, and it's being treated with HCl. So we know that this oxygen is going to grab off a proton, so we'll have our protonated alcohol. Water will leave, we'll generate a tertiary carbocation, and then chlorine will add, leading to our product that looks like this. Here we have a secondary alcohol, and we know that the alcohol can grab off a proton, forming the protonated alcohol. Water can leave, forming a secondary carbocation, and then bromine can add, nucleophile adds to electrophile, leading to this product. But understanding the details of the mechanism is even more helpful when things go a little bit different. So here we are starting out with an enantiomerically pure chiral compound. So it's only this compound, not its enantiomer. When this is treated with HBr, the alcohol is replaced by the bromide, but we end up with a mixture of enantiomers. Why does that happen? Well, as we go through the mechanistic steps, we know that the oxygen grabs a proton, forms a protonated alcohol, water leaves, giving us a tertiary carbocation. What do we know about carbocations? They are trigonal planar because Although this carbon was sp3 hybridized, now it's sp2 hybridized, so it's trigonal planar. Now, when bromine adds in the third step of the reaction, if bromine adds here from the front, we get the first product. If bromine adds from back behind the screen, then we get the second product. Because this is flat, it's pretty much equally likely for the bromine to add from the front or from the back, so this is why we get a mixture of products. So you might look at a result that seems surprising, but because you understand the mechanism, you can explain, oh, that's why that happened. But even better is when you can look at a starting material and realize that there is that risk of losing the stereochemistry and forming an enantiomeric mixture. 
Now here's another example where we're starting out with this alcohol, treating it with HCl, and we isolate this product. Okay, there might be other products, but we just wanna focus on this one for a moment. We'll notice that this carbon originally is connected to three methyl groups, but now this carbon is connected to only two methyl groups. So one methyl group is now here. So we had a skeletal rearrangement. We actually have a different carbon skeleton. So what's going on? As we work our way through the mechanism, we are going to arrive at this carbocation intermediate. This is a secondary carbocation, and we know that tertiary carbocations are more stable than secondary carbocations. Well, what if this methyl group decided to take its pair of electrons and move them over here? Now we get this, where here is the methyl group that migrated. So we can show this as a squiggle is the migration of a methyl group with its pair of electrons. So the methyl group is over here, which then leaves a positive charge over here. So this has gone from a secondary carbocation to a tertiary carbocation. And now in the, well, normally the third step of the reaction, the chlorine is going to add here, which leads to this product. So for this particular reaction, our energy diagram, we're gonna have our first step where the alcohol gets protonated. We're gonna have our rate determining step where we form the secondary carbocation, but then this is gonna undergo, we can call this a step two and a half, where this is going to be converted to a tertiary carbocation, and then the final step where chlorine adds and we get to our product. So we're actually gonna have four steps in this reaction rather than the typical three steps. The skeletal rearrangement, this is actually evidence for the existence of carbocations because that's the only way that we can get this type of rearrangement. Throughout the year, we're gonna be looking at other reactions that involve carbocations. Um, it's important to keep in mind that with carbocation rearrangement, we can have a methyl group migrate, we could have an ethyl group migrate. In some cases, we can just have a hydride migrate. So that means a hydrogen with its pair of electrons if it leads to a more stable carbocation. We can't predict how much it will happen. We can just predict that it could happen. There are also some really interesting carbocation rearrangements that happen in the biosynthesis of many important natural products. So understanding carbocations allows us to understand the mechanism of the reaction, which allows us to be able to predict reactions, which can be very powerful.